Welcome back to the final part of Lecture 3. Up to this point, we've done a lot of analysis involving the power law fluid. So now it's time to have a look at some of the other generalised Newtonian fluids that we can use. We've seen that there are limitations of the power law fluid, and the first thing we're going to do is remind ourselves what these limitations are. The big advantage of power law fluids is that the mathematics is actually relatively easy to do. We're going to introduce two more generalised Newtonian fluids, the Corot fluid and the corot yassidar fluid. One is a development of the other, and what this fluid is able to do is to capture plateau behaviour. For the Corot fluid, you can capture the low shear rate Newtonian plateau. For the corot yassidar fluid, you can capture both the low and the high shear rate Newtonian plateau. And this is reminiscent of what we see in real rheological data. One of the drawbacks of both the Corot and the corot yassidar fluid is that the mathematics gets a little harder to do and we have to be very strategic in how we divide up our flow so that we don't get some weird bifurcations in the analytical results. First of all, let's start off by reminding ourselves why sometimes we need a more complex description than the power law fluid. So on the blackboard in front of you is a graph that we saw in lecture two. And this plots apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate for the prediction of the power law model, which is there in light blue, and for some real data. It was for polystyrene, and those are the data symbols that we see on the plot as well. Remember, we have log-log axes on this graph, which is why our power law prediction looks linear. It's not, it's power law. The conversation we had around this when we first saw this graph was, look, try and keep things as simple as you can keep them, but no simpler. What we mean by that is if you've got a piece of machinery that processes a fluid and the processing shear rate is always above about two reciprocal second, we can perfectly use the power law fluid so long as we've fitted it to that shear thinning region, which is what we've done in the plot on the board. The light blue line and the experimental data coincide almost exactly in the strongly shear thinning region above two reciprocal second. And so, so long as the piece of machinery in question has that caveat of always having relatively high shear rate, this is a perfectly good model to use. There's no need to move to anything more complex unless there's some sort of processing instability like extradate swell or shark skin, which are all viscoelastic in origin and will be the subject of later lectures. If, however, we want to capture a broader range of shear rates, we can see that the power law fluid doesn't really work at all. In fact, it gets worse than that, because as the shear rate tends to zero, the apparent viscosity prediction of the power law fluid tends to infinity. Which, if we have exactly zero shear rate, means a division by zero in numerical computation. And this is really bad. And so this is the motivator for wanting more elaborate models that are able to capture plateau behaviour, especially when we're looking at numerical implementation. Implementation in, for example, computational fluid dynamics codes. So let's look at the next most simplest generalised Newtonian constitutive equation, which is the Corot constitutive equation. There on the blackboard you have the Corot model. Our apparent viscosity, e to a, is equal to e to zero, which is a plateau viscosity, and then a sum of terms involving a relaxation time and a shear rate, both raised to the power two, with the whole one plus lambda gamma dot squared raised to another power minus p. So e to zero, that's your z low shear rate Newtonian plateau viscosity in Pascal seconds. Lambda here is effectively a time constant. If we think about the terms inside that bracket, we've got a 1, which is dimensionless, plus a quantity squared, which also has to be dimensionless. So we know that gamma dot goes with reciprocal seconds as units, so therefore lambda has to have units of seconds. P here is a power law exponent, which is again dimensionless. Now, the message in the red box is really important. The power law exponent, P, is not the same thing as the power law index n in a power law fluid. We'll see how they're related shortly, but do not substitute the numerical values of one into the other. It won't work. Now, let's see 
how the corrode fluid does in predicting apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate. So the first line on this plot on the blackboard is for Newtonian fluid. It's a constant apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate. Now what I'm putting on the blackboard are predictions from the Corot model. And note that the first thing we can see is that we have a Newtonian plateau in the low shear rate region. After a critical shear rate, the fluid starts to shear thin. So this is great because if you recall back to the graph when we were looking at the merits and demerits of the power law fluid, you will recall that the polystyrene data had a low shear rate Newtonian plateau. Now, what we see here is the length of that plateau region set by the time constant lambda. The value of that plateau region is set by eta zero. How quickly the viscosity shear thins is set by p, the power law exponent. And as we increase p, the fluid becomes increasingly shear thinning. Let's change some values here. Let's change lambda and see what happens. And we can see again that a lower value of lambda results in a shorter Newtonian plateau. As we increase p at constant lambda, again, we get increasing shear thinning. So this is a very useful constitutive equation. It's now got three unknown parameters rather than two, and it is eminently fittable to experimental data. So let's have a look now at how we can start to think about interrelating the Corot equation with the power law equation. I've put the Corot equation back on the blackboard for you as a reminder. Now, what happens if the product of lambda gamma dot is far greater than one? That means that that product will dominate the bracket which involves 1 plus lambda gamma dot squared, which means that we can say, well, if that's the case, our apparent viscosity is roughly equal to eta zero, the product of lambda gamma dot raised to minus 2p. Very useful, because we can compare it directly now to the power law fluid, which I've put again on the blackboard for you. If we can compare those two, we see that our power law consistency index k is going to go with eta zero lambda to the minus two p and p is going to be equal to one minus n over two and so if we think about how we check a given result algebraically against a newtonian result we can see how we manipulate the values of p now to ensure that check so when p equals zero the Corot fluid reverts to a newtonian fluid very useful. Now, if you look in a lot of the popular computational fluid dynamics codes, you won't necessarily see the Corot equation implemented. You'll see something subtly different, the corot yacidar constitutive equation. The reason why is because this is a more flexible model. This model is able to capture both low and high shear rate Newtonian plateaus. It has five unknown parameters, and the form of it is shown there on the blackboard. So let's talk through this form. On the left-hand side, you have a quotient of two terms. You have in the top, in the numerator, you have the difference between the apparent viscosity, which is what we want, and the high shear rate Newtonian plateau viscosity, eta infinity. In the denominator, you have the maximum viscosity difference that it's possible to get in the fluid. The difference between the low shear rate Newtonian plateau, eta zero, and the high shear rate Newtonian plateau, eta infinity. So that quotient is equal to some terms on the right hand side. And we can see the terms on the right hand side actually look quite similar to the Corot equation. We've got a one plus lambda gamma dot now raised to the power a rather than two with the whole bracket raised to m minus 1 over a rather than p. So these terms, of course, have names. Eta zero is the same as the Corot eta zero. It's a zero shear rate Newtonian plateau viscosity in Pascal seconds. Eta infinity now is our high shear rate Newtonian plateau viscosity, also of units Pascal second. We still retain lambda, our time constant, but we have two indices now. We have a power law exponent m and a transition parameter a. And again, be careful, the power law index here, or the power law exponent, is not the same 
as the one in the power law fluid. And again, we have to be very careful if we want to interchange numerical data between the two constitutive laws. As before, let's see what the Kuro-Yasudar equation now predicts in terms of apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate. Again, on log-log axes on the blackboard, you've got apparent viscosity plotted out for given values of e to zero, e to infinity, and the remaining parameters. So we can see that the low shear rate plateau is set by e to zero, and we now have the presence of a high shear rate plateau, which is set by e to infinity. And the transition away from the low shear rate Newtonian plateau, how sharply you enter that shear thinning region, is governed by A, the transition parameter. And you can see now on the blackboard I have decreased A, and the fluid transitions more gently into the shear thinning region. OK, let's change our values of E to 0 and E to infinity so we can superimpose another plot on this set of axes. So I'm reducing E to 0 and I'm reducing E to infinity. And what I'm now doing is holding my transition parameter A constant and I'm manipulating M, that other power law index. And what I see if I decrease M is I change how the fluid approaches the high shear rate Newtonian plateau. And as I decrease M, we get a more um, marked transition from the shear thinning region into the high shear rate plateau region. And so there we have how a Kuro-Yasudar fluid makes its prediction of apparent viscosity. And again, this is very, very fittable against real experimental data. So let's think once more how we can manipulate the behaviour of the Kuro-Yasudar fluid to other constitutive models. And we can see if we put A equals to 2 and E to infinity to 0, we get Kuro behaviour back. We get Newtonian behaviour when M equals A equals 1. Now, just a caution once again about analytical solutions to both the Kuro and the Kuro-Yasudar fluid is that you have to be very careful when using these expressions because you can find that you get bifurcating results. So very carefully choose where your integration limits, especially in pipe flow, lie. Typically, you will integrate over half the flow field. Otherwise, you end up with minus numbers with brackets mazed to varying powers with the result changing whether that power is positive or negative. So be careful. Some key points to recap on. The bottom line here is that many different generalised Newtonian fluid models exist. We've only looked at three, but in my view, they're the three most important. We've got the power law, the Corot, and the corot yasudar models. And these models are ones that you will find very frequently in computational work. We've reminded ourselves that the power law fluid is indeed simple, but is not necessarily appropriate for all situations that you might encounter. The Corot model has three adjustable parameters and is capable of capturing low shear rate Newtonian plateau. The Corot Yasudar model is a development of the Corot model with five adjustable parameters and it has low and high shear rate Newtonian plateau and you can manipulate the transition away from and to those plateau by the various power that we have. And the final note, beware of interchanging absolute values of parameters between different constitutive equations.